two. Welcome back to WNST, Tass in Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. We're not in Baltimore today. We are in Annapolis. They've got Don Moeller caffeinated here this morning. Good morning to everybody. Ready to go. 4.30 comes here, early. Because we, we've done a lot on education, right? We've done a lot on the city and on crime and on politics. Today it's hospitals, and today it's medicine. And um, I said to you a year and a half ago, we start this thing, I want to learn stuff. So we're here to learn today. We're learning. And, and I think today, Nestor, we're focusing on a topic and issues that literally affect, and you'll, we'll talk about our guest here in just a second, affect Every family in the state of Maryland. I mean, there's, I can't think of anyone who doesn't have a hospital story, doesn't have a health care story. My wife was in the it's, ER it's 10 hours on Sunday. Just this okay? weekend. So, so we know. We were, we were at a clinic last Wednesday. So I've been in two hospitals in the last eight days. So Families wow. are touched by this issue, and we're <coughs> going we're gonna to learn a lot in the next 15 or 20 minutes. Who do we got? Next? All right. Let's, let's do, I want to get the pronunciation right because John and I have been back and forth. There's only one right way to pronounce your name, and you know how to do it. <laughs> It's John Chassar. 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 There you go. All right. I want to make sure I get that right. You said that's Chassar. an Ellis Island special, right? <laughs> yeah. My uh, grandfather was from Sicily, and when he came over, they uh, changed the last letter uh, when he was entering the country, and he just kept his mouth shut. Well, I woke up, and I, I went to look for you on LinkedIn, and we're connected. John is the, uh, the president and CEO of GBMC, which is where my brother was born. Um, you know, I mean, we all have a, uh, Everybody has a GBMC Charles, story. From for Baltimore. those of you listening and not from the region, Charles Street, Baltimore County, 21204, right, John? <laughs> People <laughs> Loyola would say it's up the hill. Or, up the hill from right, Loyola. Right Don's old job right, in Greenwood. Exactly. Right, right? Absolutely. Exactly. We're also joined by Brian Frazee. He is the government affairs and policy uh, a specialist and VP from the Maryland Hospital Association. You guys are putting this on, so I want to give you a little oxygen to talk. Well, what's the goal in Annapolis today other than to do really good podcast on Baltimore Positive, right? Sure. sure thank you. So uh, this morning, MHA, the Maryland Hospital Association, is hosting our first ever legislative breakfast. First ever. First Inaugural. ever. Inaugural. All right. First ever. Yes. So we are very excited about it. We have about 75 hospital executives and government relations leads from across the state. Guys like this guy. Yep. Guys like Dr. Chazar. And ladies. Um, and ladies. Yes, of course. Of course. Um, and so they are going to descend on Annapolis today. This morning, we're going to provide a detailed legislative preview for them, give an analysis of Governor Hogan's budget that was released yesterday as it relates to health care. Uh, and then we're going to have some key legislative leaders uh, come by later to speak and, and interact with our members. Well, what's your initial? Uh, I'm sorry, Nestor, yeah, but I want to jump. Uh, Brian just said something, and I know you haven't had a whole lot of deep dive. You haven't had a lot of time yet. What's your first takeaway from the governor's budget regarding health care in Maryland? Yeah, so overall, the, the budget was fairly positive uh, for health care in Maryland. Um, you know, we're still digging into all of the details, right. but our first look. Uh, we have two budget priorities at the Maryland Hospital Association that we advocate on on behalf of the hospital field in Maryland, uh, one of which is the Medicaid deficit assessment. Um, this is a uh, assessment that was placed on hospital bills back in 2009. We've been uh, advocating to reduce that by a certain amount each year. Uh, Governor Hogan and the General Assembly have been very supportive of that effort, and they've been committed to it for several years now. Uh, we did see yesterday that the governor included a $15 million reduction in that assessment this year. Uh, we asked for 25, but we got 15. He did increase the commitment for the following year, uh, but we will be trying to increase, uh, uh, fulfill the commitment this year to the 25 uh, with the General Assembly. But uh, we do appreciate both of their efforts on that. Um, workforce is another top priority for us. We were very, very happy to see that the governor included an additional $400,000 for Maryland's loan assistance and repayment program. Uh, so that will help us recruit and retain qualified uh, physicians uh, in underserved areas in the state. And as Dr. Chazar knows, uh, we do a member survey every year. And this past year, workforce was the number one priority of our hospital executives. So We heard that, we heard that earlier. W one of the things we try to do on Baltimore Positive. We try to think of our folks who are driving in their car, they're listening to the podcast. You talked about the medical Medicaid deficit assessment. <laughs> I always yes. say, the guy in their car Very is technical. Going, the, the what? The what? Give us the four dummies explanation of what that means, medic and why we should care about it. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, good opportunity to do that. So the, the Medicaid deficit assessment is essentially, um, it adds about 2% to every hospital bill in the state. So it's a pass-through. So think of it as the, like a, the sales tax. Um, so hospitals don't see any of that money. Uh, we have a rate setting commission at the state level that sets hospital rates. Uh, we're the only state in the country that has that system. 
Uh, but this assessment was placed to help backfill the state budget when we were in the Great Recession 10 years ago. Um, but it ballooned almost $400 million in 2015. And at that point, that's when Governor Hogan and the Democratic leadership in the General Assembly said, we're going to commit to reducing this to reduce health care costs and also help us under that unique agreement that we have with the federal government. So for families, if, if we secure this increased funding, it actually does reduce the cost of health care yes. for families? Yes, it Bringing does. it down to their level? Yep. It's one of the most direct ways the General Assembly and the governor can directly reduce health care costs. I think one of the things I've really learned in a year of doing this is how important the government is at at every level. And, you know, my wife's been in and out of the hospital a whole bunch. My wife's a two-time leukemia survivor, so we're very familiar with the Johns Hopkins medical uh, system and, and, and learning it. John, I, I want to ask you, because, you know, I've talked to Ron Peterson, talked to other people. I've, I know some other people in the medical space, uh, you know, through the course of years. When you come down here once a year, what does the government need to do for any hospital, for any, not just your, not for just GBMC, but how can Annapolis help you to help my wife or his grandson, anyone who is a medical patient that's going to need doctors the rest of their lives. You know, well, my wife's diabetic. Yeah, well, it's a great time to be in healthcare, And uh, the government is, is uh, playing a big role in this without getting into the detail. Uh, Maryland is, a, is, a, is a, an incubator for change for the health care system in the country. Uh, we spend more as a country per capita by 40% on health care than any other country in the world. And there's a recognition that we're not always uh, buying value with that money. And we're going to hear that a lot in the presidential campaign this year. It's going to be a big part of that. Right. So, th so Maryland uh, right now is incentivizing people like me and GBMC to uh, create a better system. Uh, we, have fabu we, we may have the best doctors and nurses in the world in Maryland. Uh, we've always had great people, but the issue has not been the people. The issue has been the system. So uh, there's a lot of fabulous things now going on in Maryland. Let me just t give you a few snippets about GBMC. So back in 2011, uh, our board decided that we had great doctors and nurses. We were doing great services, but we really had to make it, design it, make it feel like a system so that the patient wasn't uh, left in the middle. And, and we created this vision phrase to every patient every time we'll provide the care we would want for our own loved ones. And we realized that the deficit was coordination. So we started doing things to create a true system, a better coordination. We, we, uh, uh, adopted uh, the, the concept of the patient-centered medical home. What is that? Well, everybody, most people have their own primary care physician, but one of the problems is historically they're open nine to five. On the weekend, you struggle. You just went through that. Just went through. Yeah. So our offices are open till seven or nine, Monday through Friday. They're open Saturday and Sunday. But it's less about visits now. It's more about an accountability. It's about a partnership. Uh, we use technology to the extent possible. We use the, uh, uh, we have a one uh, medical record for our whole company, and you can get to your own record through an app. Um, My wife did that to learn about her strep throat condition. It came three days late. It wasn't your hospital. I'll take it up with someone else. <laughs> uh, and then we, then we started uh, uh, actually seeing what is it that the community needs. And we started uh, adding pieces. Uh, we added a, sadly, uh, there was a need for a child abuse protection team. We added that. Um, GBMC is now the center of Baltimore County's uh, sexual assault forensic examination program. So uh, critically you know, important. Critically I just have important. To, and I have to thank you for that as the former Baltimore County executive in the role that right. you and your hospital play in that. It, it really part of a team. So, it's, it's, you know, you can imagine your loved one was just raped. Oh, my God. And, and they wind up in a busy emergency department. And the physicians and nurses are desperate to do the right medical thing. But they don't quite have all the training on the forensics. Well, now we have a separate place where people who've been... Uh, abused go. They are seen by a trained nurse who knows not only the medical side, but also the forensic side, which, because if it's your loved one, you want two things to happen. You want him or her to get evidence-based medical care, but you also want a shot at finding the perpetrator. You want the forensics done correctly. That's not reimbursed by health insurance. So uh, we, we do it with philanthropy, basically. 
another exciting thing that, that we've done is uh, very few people know that Gilchrist is a part of GBMC. Sure. And uh, when I came to town, we were serving, a, in 2010, we were serving about 350 elders with end-of-life care every day. And today, it's up to 1,000. You may know that Gilchrist went into the city of Baltimore to rescue what was then the Joseph Ritchie House, which was a, a hospice serving the most underserved people. They were going bankrupt. Gilchrist took them over. And now, not, not only are they doing very well, but we're about to build a new uh, Gilchrist Center, Baltimore at Stadium Place. We don't talk a lot about dignity at the end of life. I mean, Don was yeah. around at the end of my mother's life two and a half years ago, and hey, it's coming for all of us, right? And, Absolutely. And, and w whatever that dignity is, right. uh, I'd like it to be better. Absolutely. And, and again, I can say with, with, with the doc sitting here, many of us have unfortunately been to Gilchrist yeah. with loved ones. Yes. I, I immediately thinking two or three, four experiences I think John right away. And my, my the, the, the focus on the emotional well-being of yes. the family to make that very difficult time palatable is, is really remarkable in terms of what happens at yes. Gilchrist. And we've also added bereavement services because, you know, as, you, as everyone knows, every human knows, it doesn't end with the death of the loved one. We, there's also spouses, family members that are still suffering, and, and, and we serve them. We've also added now, because um, there, are, there are senior citizens that are frail. They're not dying. They don't need hospice, but they're too frail to make it to the doctor's office. So we are now providing primary care in the home. We call it our elder care in the home program. We're serving about 400 people Old every school, single right? day. Yeah, house calls. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's house calls. Um, the other thing we're very excited about is, uh, you know, I, I love your podcast. Uh, I hate it when people are just negative. Uh, GBMC was asked by the Helping Up Mission to come down and to provide advanced primary care to the 500 men that are resident there. I've spent some time there. It's a special place. You're it is special. Helping I'm up, not. Helping Up's incredible. It's an incredible story downtown. Yeah. Tell us more about yeah, it, Doc. Well, do. and they're about, they're building a new building for women, addicted women and their children, and, and we will be providing primary care to them as well. But what we said to the Helping Up Mission folks is we're delighted to come down there, but as long as we're coming, let's open the primary care office to the whole neighborhood. So starting this week, that office is open for advanced primary care to, to all the citizens of that neighborhood. We're talking East Baltimore. There are, yeah. Jonestown. It's, yeah. a, it's a very, very underserved medically with primary care neighborhood. And uh, we're delighted because very few people know that GBMC was formed in 65 through the merger of the Women's Hospital for the City of Baltimore and the Presbyterian Ear, Nose, and Throat Hospital. And guess what? They're... Helping Up Mission is in the building that was that oh, hospital. Wow. So we're going back to our roots. And we're doing this because Baltimore's a great place, but we have to go to the it, point of the problem and help the people that need it the most. Well, what we And again, for a reminder for folks in their cars, uh, we are chatting health care and behavioral health and community health with Dr. John Shasher from GBMC and uh, Brian Frazee from the uh, Maryland Hospital Association. Uh, what role, as you talk, your mind begins to race. I'm sure <laughs> yours does too, Nestor. What role does opioid addiction and the opioid crisis in the United States play in all of this community health issue? And maybe you both can talk from your own perspectives about what role your organization plays in that. And then what's the role of community hospitals in that? Well, let, let, me, let me start. First of all, uh, we, and I'm a pediatrician, but doctors and nurses, especially physicians, had to start with the realization that they were part of the origins of the opioid epidemic, that uh, they were, the physicians were sold a bill of goods, that um, newer opioid medications were not addictive. And... The, uh, all the agencies started pressuring physicians to minimize pain. Now, the minimization of pain is a wonderful goal, but they, it was pushed to use these medications uh, because it's going to be fine. The patients will have their pain relieved and they won't get addicted. That was not true. So physicians started 
using, giving people way too much medication and they had it in their medic medicine closet, you know, their depressed teenage son may have grabbed right. it and w the opioid epidemic was off to the races. Well, I think as I get older, I'm 51 now, 20 years ago, th there was a mentality, take a pill for it. Now it's... If I take that pill, I'm going to lead to another pill. Well, I think that the whole world is aware of how. I mean, so, even as a sports guy like Brett Favre, and yeah. I mean, you become aware of it if it's not in your own family. Yeah. So I think I think that part of the problem is now under control. That physicians and nurses now know. Let's start with the minimum uh, amount of medication required, and let's only get to. Uh, narcotics, opioids, if the patient really needs it. So, so that's the front end. That's and, the and front end. And what I end. hear from folks, though, is what role, and it's certainly something we grappled with in the county, it's something they grapple with in the city, all over the United States. What role do hospitals so, play in then the treatment okay, for those so who do get the, the, the opioid and then they wake up a week later and they're addicted so and let they me, need help. So let me tell you what we're doing at GBMC, which all Maryland's hospitals and, and uh, are, are doing in. this. But we're, uh, w every, now every patient that comes to the GBMC ED is, uh, gets screened for addiction. The patient can refuse the screen, but it, they're very simple, four or five question screen. So if I come into the emergency room, I'm you're, getting screened. You're getting screened. Oh, interesting. If you screen positive, you are asked if you would like to meet with a peer counselor. Now, Brian, is that is that standard practice now across the state, or is that something? It's not, sta no. it's not standard. It's called the SBERT. A screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. But you need this person to be honest with you, right? You need I, the person I've, to I've be rarely honest. met a drug addict who's honest. Right? Well, like, little, you know. well, see, the recognition was that we were rescuing patients. So for over the past seven, eight years during the epidemic, many uh, addicted people would come into the GBMCED, get rescued and sent out on the street. And the belief was it's an opportunity. Not every addict is ready for treatment. But the ones that are ready, we want to capture them and get them started at that moment. So that's what SBIRT is all about. Now in our advanced primary care s uh, centers, at every checkup, we are screening everyone not only for addiction but also for depression. Because depression th is also a starting point for uh, addiction and and we we need to, to treat depression anyway so we are also using now formally the expert program in our advanced primary care offices we have uh, in these uh, primary care offices we have masters prepared behavioralists we have uh, addiction specialists and we have the opportunity to refer to a psychiatrist so uh, we want it the primary care doctor wants to help the patient create that system I was talking about before. In the old days, the primary care doc would say, uh, I've got somebody who's addicted. I don't know what to do next. I have nobody here to help me. Here, why don't you call this number? Well, now we identify them and somebody walks right into the office and gives them the opportunity to start therapy. So, uh, and, uh, so it's a really intervention. Like, it's an intervention, yes. It's a better design system to get the people the help they need faster and more efficient. Not go yeah. away and make an appointment 10 days from now and go, go use for 10 more days, right? Because yes. that's we, the way it used to be. Yes. If, okay. if we take a community approach, and I don't want to put words in either one of your mouths, but if we take a community approach to that and we go to 10,000 feet and we look at what you're doing, the person's come in, we've identified them, we hope we can get them to treatment. Does that then, I think I know the answer, but correct me if I'm wrong, does that then require government to be a partner and have more opportunities and fund more places with treatment on demand? Am I, am I going in the right direction there or am I missing Yes, that? I think government, and we see the state and local governments uh, desperate to try to help here, and they have, create, they have helped, they have created uh, programs there. Uh, Baltimore County is working hard to uh, open up more uh, treatment centers, and uh, there's a push to get more primary care doctors involved and certified to actually uh, give uh, medication-assisted wow. treatment because we know that medication-assisted assisted treatment is more successful than non-medication-assisted well, treatment. Well, and, and I'll put in a plug for Baltimore County Executive John Oshevsky, who 
as part of his transition task force, you yes. may have, I don't know, I was either on one it, of, yes. but you served on it, I yes. think, had an opioid task force with recommendations, yes. and it recognized up front. I was the chair of that oh, task they, force. They, so then I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but one of the recommendations was that the county was going to have to get serious and look at its zoning regulations. Yes. Yes. If we're going to provide treatment on demand, so again, if you're in your car and you're listening and you want to make a difference and your family's been touched by this, recognize that the county executive and the county council is taking a serious look at this issue. We have to make zoning changes in Baltimore County, right, Doc? Yes, you- yes. And if we're talking about the role of government, I'll tell you one, and you know, Brian and his team and uh, all the hospital executives will be discussing this with legislators as well. Uh, we have a crisis uh, that we're not dealing with effectively right now, and that is the uh, inpatient placement crisis. So yesterday, we had eight children in GBMC's pediatric emergency department who were essentially living there because there is no uh, pediatric inpatient bed for them. They need a psychiatric bed, wow. and there is no placement. And with, what are the I ages w- of these children? They're, they're, they're ra- most of them Range. are teenagers, okay. but uh, I think I'm not precisely sure okay. what yesterday's ages Either were. Either middle school or high school, yeah. probably. And then on the adult side, we had another 12 adults who are essentially living in the GBMC ED because there is no placement for them. What do we do? All right, um, now I'm going to turn to you. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot. Yes. What do we do, or what is the legislature? I mean, because I hear that. I think we talked about it informally out in the hallway. I hear that frustration from families all the time. Yes. That they've got a loved one in emotional distress, maybe suicidal ideations, and they can't get the help they need. All right, Brian, what do we do? (laughs) Yeah, so, well, first let me say that addressing Maryland's behavioral health crisis has been a top priority of the Maryland Hospital Association for many years now. Uh, We've been working very closely with the state, with our local governments, the General Assembly, our hospitals, our community partners in this uh, to really develop a coordinated system. And and I also want to say the GBMC is a great example of some of the great work that our hospitals are doing to address the behavioral health crisis. Can can you define behavioral health just broadly defined as what that – would that just – mean mental health? I mean, no, so behavioral health means mental health and substance use disorders okay. together. Um, so uh, when we say behavioral health, we're talking about both. Uh, not necessarily both together. Uh, you know, p- some, some have uh, only mental health issues. Some people have substance use issues. Some people have both. Uh, but when we talk about behavioral health, we're talking about both, uh, both disorders. So what, what, what do we need? And, and I'm, both of you probably spend an awful lot of time in Annapolis over the next 90 days. What do we need? Again, help, I always say, I go back to, I always go back to our folks who are listening in the car. Help them. What do you need from Annapolis? What do they need to be saying to their legislators? Yeah, so I think the number one thing is that we need more investment in community behavioral health services. You heard Dr. Chazar talk about uh, the lack of capacity. Huge issue. Capacity and workforce, I would say, are the top two issues in behavioral health right now. Well, when I think about Um, living in the city, I mean, I've had the same homeless man living on my corner for 16 years. I've lived downtown. I didn't see him this morning, but I'll see him this afternoon. And I'm thinking to myself, as a society, the hospital, the state, at, at some point, this man... How many more years are we going to allow this? And when I think behavioral health, I think about that, but I think, well, if he were my uncle, if I pulled up and I wanted to help him, or if a police officer pulled, other than giving him a dollar, right, which is the obvious thing any of us, or give him a bottle of water, what, what does the state's role play in that, and where do hospitals and Annapolis come into that? Right, absolutely. So the state has invested a lot of money in community behavioral health services over the last few years, so I do want to recognize that. Uh, but we do need more. We need more capacity. Our hospitals are trying to develop partnerships with community behavioral health uh, providers so that you can get that referral to treatment and have it be seamless. Um, One bill that the hospital association is pushing this year is really aimed at getting more access points for behavioral health patients. So one example of that is if you are on an emergency petition, uh, under current law, a police officer must take you to a hospital emergency department for a medical clearance before you get your psychiatric evaluation. 
what we've heard and the data suggests that you don't have to go to a hospital emergency department in most cases if you're an emergency petition patient. And so what we're trying to do is uh, open that definition up so that uh, to provide flexibility so that you could go to a crisis center, which is a new model that uh, the state is investing in, or another more appropriate setting than a hospital emergency department uh, when you're an individual that has a behavioral health crisis. Is, is that a problem we, for you, oh, for GBMC, oh, people it, coming into emergency room that don't ab- really need an emergency room? It absolutely is. And um, the, emer- we, the, the whole society has used the emergency department as the pathway of least resistance. And doctors are the, are the biggest culprits in this. I can't deal with this in my office. Go to the emergency room. Well, <laughs> the emergency department was built for emergencies. And now it's at, they're at a breaking point because they are being used as the place to house everybody else's problems. So I already told I, this big one of mental health patients who have no place to go, uh, the opioid epidemic um, people without good primary care they get a cold they come to the emergency yeah room. and and yeah. It, it, w- it has been framed historically that they just don't know how to use the system that is not true I, I was a pediatrician treating inner city kids the issue is they go to the emergency department because they don't have any other option and, and, and I, I I don't mean I'm not taking shots at, at GBMC or any of the hospitals because I think you've really framed why it is but I am convinced of what I'm about to say, and that is that for most Americans, going to the emergency room is a pretty horrific It is. It was experience. a horrific experience I mean, Nestor's me. wife just spent 10 hours, we won't yeah. say which hospital, 10 hours over the weekend, yeah. not very successfully. And you feel very often, and maybe yes. you can't, this wasn't on topic, you feel abandoned yes. in an yes. emergency room. What, yes. what do we, we call the emergency department on Monday around? to get a well, test result? Right. And they told me I'd have to come back to the emergency room and check in to find well, out if the strep test so on Monday came. And then my wife found it on the app Wednesday. She was negative but had been taking amoxicillin for four days and, and stomach sick as a it, – it, it's – and so, so, you, so how you, do you we can just be that? mad so, and I can scream, but I can't even call back to the well, hospital. So I, I want to go back to where I started. So w- at GBMC, we've embraced the concept of the patient-centered medical home. And if, it, if your wife was sick, we would want her in our office. And then we are accountable for making sure that we check the lab result and we get back to her to say stop taking But not your emergency department. No, no, no. The emergency department is not designed for that. The emergency department, and we desperately need to free it up because with the aging of the population, we're going to have more really sick people that are that acutely need those emergency departments. So this is a design challenge. Well, and as, as the CEO of GBMC, it has to frustrate you because I am sure, I think we've had this discussion before, I know that all these CEOs who are tracking that data, the wait time, the success, and it's just a challenge. Well, but, but see, I, I want to I, I go back. You guys are talking about positivity, and I want right. to tell you we are fixing that. Right, that's At what GBMC, I'm asking. you should expect if you're sick on the weekend – Unless it is an em- truly an emergency where you don't have time, we want you in our office yeah. and we want to own I that. I think that's – and has that what, had an effect on – It, it absolutely yeah. has had an effect. The problem is we have 100 primary care clinicians and, you know, the rest of the world is, is still – uh, in systems that are not quite there you've yet. You've made an investment. So we've made an investment. We've taken a chunk of the problem out, but, but we need uh, the redesign throughout the whole state to continue. I, 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 know I could you go both, all day. I know they, yeah, and I, I know I they, both, they both up. need <laughs> to get back to the conference. <laughs> Brian, before we let you both go, uh, now we've got folks out there. They're going, man, they're singing my song. They're talking about all these things I care about. Folks out there in their cars listening at home, how do they keep tabs on what you all are doing legislatively so they can weigh in, find the status of bills? Yes. Well, you so are the advocate, right, of the people, right? Like, literally. Yeah. We are. We, yes. Yeah. Yes, we are. We advocate for our patients. Um, we, so mhaonline.org is the Maryland Hospital Association's website. Uh, we have a tab on there called Advocacy, and you can find all of our information on there. I used uh, the right word. See? testimony I'm bills. You there you go. Older. Yep. Uh, we have a dashboard. <laughs> it's very user-friendly, so if you go there, you can find M- everything M-H-A. we're doing. MHA. Dot org. MHA online. MHA 
Online.org. Nestor, yep. I'm getting all kind of high signs. These oh, guys okay, are needed right, elsewhere. Go. All right, go. <laughs> Where are Thank we? Thank you. What Thank are we doing? We're in Annapolis at the Maryland House. Uh, we're doing all sorts of cool things. Big thanks to John Shazar. Is that I get it right? Yep. There yes. you go. I knew I'd get it. It took me 25 GBMC. minutes. GBMC. And Brian Frazee, uh, Government Affairs Policy for the Maryland Hospital Association. He's Don. I'm Nestor. We are Baltimore Positive. I'll be over at John's office, and we'll be talking about things before <laughs> it's all over with. We are WNST.net. AM 1570 and Baltimore Positive. Signing off from Annapolis. Yeah.